of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud. Chapter 53 Taking the paper with him, Mr. Carey retired to his study. Philip changed his chair for that in which his uncle had been sitting, it was the only comfortable one in the room, and looked out of the window at the pouring rain. Even in that sad weather there was something restful about the green fields that stretched to the horizon. There was an intimate charm in the landscape which he did not remember ever to have noticed before. Two years in France had opened his eyes to the beauty of his own countryside. He thought with a smile of his uncle's remark. It was lucky that the turn of his mind tended to flippancy. He had begun to realize what a great loss he had sustained in the death of his father and mother. That was one of the differences in his life which prevented him from seeing things in the same way as other people. The love of parents for their children is the only emotion which is quite disinterested. Among strangers he had grown as best as he could, but he had seldom been used with patience or forbearance. He prided himself on his self-control. It had been whipped into him by the mockery of his fellows. Then they called him cynical and callous. He had acquired calmness of demeanor, and under most circumstances an unruffled exterior, so that now he could not show his feelings. People told him he was unemotional, but he knew that he was at the mercy of his emotions. An accidental kindness touched him so much that sometimes he did not venture to speak in order not to betray the unsteadiness of his voice. He remembered the bitterness of his life at school, the humiliation which he had endured, the banter which had made him morbidly afraid of making himself ridiculous, and he remembered the loneliness he had felt since, faced with the world, the disillusion and the disappointment caused by the difference between what it promised to his active imagination and what it gave. But notwithstanding he was able to look at himself from the outside and smile with amusement. By Jove, if I weren't flippant I should hang myself, he thought cheerfully. His mind went back to the answer he had given his uncle when he asked him what he had learnt in Paris. He had learnt a good deal more than he told him. A conversation with Cronshaw had stuck in his memory, and one phrase he had used, a commonplace one enough, had set his brain working. "'My dear fellow,' Cronshaw said, "'there's no such thing as abstract morality.' When Philip ceased to believe in Christianity he felt that a great weight was taken from his shoulders. Casting off the responsibility which weighed down every action, when every action was infinitely important for the welfare of his immortal soul, he experienced a vivid sense of liberty. But he knew now that this was an illusion. When he put away the religion in which he had been brought up, he had kept unimpaired the morality which was part and parcel of it. He made up his mind, therefore, to think things out for himself. He determined to be swayed by no prejudices. He swept away the virtues and the vices, the established laws of good and evil, with the idea of finding out the rules of life for himself. He did not know whether rules were necessary at all. That was one of the things he wanted to discover. Clearly much that seemed valid seemed so only because he had been taught it from his earliest youth. He had read a number of books, but they did not help him much, for they were based on the morality of Christianity, and even the writers who emphasized the fact that they did not believe in it were never satisfied till they had framed a system of ethics in accordance with that of the Sermon on the Mount. It seemed hardly worth while to read a long volume in order to learn that you ought to behave exactly like everybody else. Philip wanted to find out how he ought to behave, and he thought he could prevent himself from being influenced by the opinions that surrounded him. But meanwhile he had to go on living, and until he formed a theory of conduct he made himself a provisional rule. Follow your inclinations with due regard to the policeman round the corner. He thought the best thing he had gained in Paris was a complete liberty of spirit, and he felt himself at last absolutely free. In a desultory way he had read a good deal of philosophy, and he looked forward with delight to the leisure of the next few months. He began to read at haphazard. He entered upon each system with a little thrill of excitement, expecting to find in each some guide by which he could rule his conduct. He felt himself like a traveller in unknown countries 
and as he pushed forward the enterprise fascinated him. He read emotionally, as other men read pure literature, and his heart leaped as he discovered in noble words what himself had obscurely felt. His mind was concrete and moved with difficulty in regions of the abstract, but even when he could not follow the reasoning it gave him a curious pleasure to follow the tortuosities of thoughts that threaded their nimble way on the edge of the incomprehensible. Sometimes great philosophers seemed to have nothing to say to him, but at others he recognized a mind with which he felt himself at home. He was like the explorer in Central Africa who comes suddenly upon wide uplands, with great trees in them and stretches of meadow, so that he might fancy himself in an English park. He delighted in the robust common sense of Thomas Hobbes. Spinoza filled him with awe. He had never before come in contact with a mind so noble, so unapproachable and austere. It reminded him of that statue by Rodin, L'Age de Han, which he passionately admired. And then there was Hume. The skepticism of that charming philosopher touched a kindred note in Philip and, reveling in the lucid style which seemed able to put complicated thought into simple words, musical and measured, he read as he might have read a novel, a smile of pleasure on his lips. But in none could he find exactly what he wanted. He had read somewhere that every man was born a Platonist, an Aristotelian, a Stoic, or an Epicurean, and the history of George Henry Lewes, besides telling you that philosophy was all moonshine, was there to show that the thought of each philosopher was inseparably connected with the man he was, when you knew that you could guess, to a great extent, the philosophy he wrote. It looked as though you did not act in a certain way because you thought in a certain way, but rather that you thought in a certain way because you were made in a certain way. Truth had nothing to do with it. There was no such thing as truth. Each man was his own philosopher and the elaborate systems which the great men of the past had composed were only valid for the writers. The thing, then, was to discover what one was, and one system of philosophy would devise itself. It seemed to Philip that there were three things to find out. Man's relation to the world he lives in, man's relation with the men among whom he lives, and, finally, man's relation to himself. He made an elaborate plan of study. The advantage of living abroad is that, coming in contact with the manners and customs of the people among whom you live, you observe them from the outside, and see that they have not the necessity which those who practice them believe. You cannot fail to discover that the beliefs which to you are self-evident to the foreigner are absurd. The year in Germany, the long stay in Paris, had prepared Philip to receive the skeptical teaching which came to him now with such a feeling of relief. He saw that nothing was good and nothing was evil. Things were merely adapted to an end. He read The Origin of Species. It seemed to offer an explanation of much that troubled him. He was like an explorer now who has reasoned that certain natural features must be present themselves, and, beating up a broad river, finds here the tributary that he expected, there the fertile populated plains, and further on the mountains. When some great discovery is made the world is surprised afterwards that it was not accepted at once, and even on those who acknowledge its truth the effect is unimportant. The first readers of The Origin of Species accepted it with their reason, but their emotions, which are the ground of conduct, were untouched. Philip was born a generation after this great book was published, and much that horrified its contemporaries had passed into the feeling of the time so that he was able to accept it with a joyful heart. He was intensely moved by the grandeur of the struggle for life and the ethical rule which it suggested seemed to fit in with his predispositions. He said to himself that might was right. Society stood on one side, an organism with its own laws of growth and self-preservation, while the individual stood on the other. The actions which were to the advantage of society it termed virtuous and those which were not it called vicious. Good and evil meant nothing more than that. Sin was a prejudice from which the free man should rid himself. Society had three arms in its contest with the individual, laws, public opinion, and conscience. The first two could be met by guile, 
Guile is the only weapon of the weak against the strong. Common opinion put the matter well when it stated that sin consisted in being found out. But conscience was the traitor within the gates. It fought in each heart the battle of society, and caused the individual to throw himself a wanton sacrifice to the prosperity of his enemy. For it was clear that the two were irreconcilable, the state and the individual conscience of himself. That uses the individual for its own ends, trampling upon him if he thwarts it, rewarding him with medals, pensions, honors, when he serves it faithfully. This, strong only in his independence, threads his way through the state, for convenience sake, paying in money or service for certain benefits, but with no sense of obligation. And, indifferent to the rewards, asks only to be left alone. He is the independent traveler, who uses Cook's tickets because they save trouble, but looks with good-humored contempt on the personally conducted parties. The free man can do no wrong. He does everything he likes, if he can. His power is the only measure of his morality. He recognizes the laws of the state, and he can break them without sense of sin, but if he is punished he accepts the punishment without rancor. Society has the power. But if for the individual there was no right or wrong, then it seemed to Philip that conscience lost its power. It was with a cry of triumph that he seized the knave and flung him from his breast, but he was no nearer to the meaning of life than he had been before. Why the world was there and what men had come into existence for at all was as inexplicable as ever. Surely there must be some reason. He thought of Cronshaw's parable of the Persian carpet. He offered it as a solution of the riddle, and mysteriously he stated that it was no answer at all unless you found it out for yourself. I wonder what the devil he meant, Philip smiled. And so, on the last day of September, eager to put into practice all these new theories of life, Philip, with sixteen hundred pounds and his club foot, set out for a second time to London to make his third start in life. Chapter 54 the examination Philip had passed before he was articled to a chartered accountant was sufficient qualification for him to enter a medical school. He chose St. Luke's because his father had been a student there, and before the end of the summer session had gone up to London for a day in order to see the secretary. He got a list of rooms from him, and took lodgings in a dingy house which had the advantage of being within two minutes' walk of the hospital. "'You'll have to arrange about a part to dissect,' the secretary told him you'd better start on a leg. They generally do. They seem to think it easier. Philip found that his first lecture was in anatomy at eleven, and about half-past ten he limped across the road and a little nervously made his way to the medical school. Just inside the door a number of notices were pinned up, lists of lectures, football fixtures, and the like, and these he looked at idly, trying to seem at his ease. Young men and boys dribbled in and looked for letters in the rack, chatted with one another, and passed downstairs to the basement in which was the student's reading room. Philip saw several fellows with a desultory, timid look dawdling around and surmised that, like himself, they were there for the first time. When he had exhausted the notices he saw a glass door which led into what was apparently a museum, and having still twenty minutes to spare he walked in. It was a collection of pathological specimens. Presently a boy of about eighteen came up to him. "'I say, are you first year?' he said. "'Yes,' answered Philip. "'Where's the lecture room, do you know? It's getting on for eleven. We'd better try to find it.' They walked out of the museum into a long, dark corridor, with the walls painted in two shades of red, and other youths walking along suggested the way to them. They came to a door marked Anatomy Theatre. Philip found that there were a good many people already there. The seats were arranged in tiers, and just as Philip entered, an attendant came in, put a glass of water on the table in the well of the lecture room, and then brought in a pelvis and two thigh bones, right and left. More men entered and took their seats, and by eleven the theater was fairly full. There were about sixty students. For the most part they were a good deal younger than Philip, smooth-faced boys of eighteen, but there were a few who were older than he. He noticed one tall man with a fierce red moustache, who might have been thirty, another little fellow with black hair only a year or two younger, 
and then there was one man with spectacles and a beard which was quite gray. The lecturer came in, Mr. Cameron, a handsome man with white hair and clean-cut features. He called out the long list of names. Then he made a little speech. He spoke in a pleasant voice with well-chosen words, and he seemed to take a discreet pleasure in their careful arrangement. He suggested one or two books which they might buy and advised the purchase of a skeleton. He spoke of anatomy with enthusiasm. It was essential to the study of surgery. A knowledge of it added to the appreciation of art. Philip pricked up his ears. He heard later that Mr. Cameron lectured also to the students at the Royal Academy. He had lived many years in Japan with a post at the University of Tokyo, and he flattered himself on his appreciation of the beautiful. "'You will have to learn many tedious things,' he finished with an indulgent smile, "'which you will forget the moment you have passed your final examination. But in anatomy it is better to have learned and lost than never to have learned at all.' He took up the pelvis which was lying on the table and began to describe it. He spoke well and clearly. At the end of the lecture the boy who had spoken to Philip in the pathological museum and sat next to him in the theater suggested that they should go to the dissecting room. Philip and he walked along the corridor again, and an attendant told them where it was. As soon as they entered Philip understood what the acrid smell was which he had noticed in the passage. He lit a pipe. The attendant gave a short laugh. "'You'll soon get used to the smell. I don't notice it myself.' He asked Philip's name and looked at a list on the board. "'You've got a leg, number four. Philip saw that another name was bracketed with his own. "'What's the meaning of that?' he asked. "'We're very short of bodies just now. We've had to put two on each part.' The dissecting room was a large apartment painted like the corridors, the upper part a rich salmon, and the dado a dark terracotta. At regular intervals down the long sides of the room, at right angles with the wall, were iron slabs, grooved like meat dishes, and on each lay a body. Most of them were men. They were very dark from the preservative in which they had been kept, and the skin had almost the look of leather. They were extremely emaciated. The attendant took Philip up to one of the slabs. A youth was standing by it. "'Is your name Carrie?' he asked. "'Yes.' "'Oh, then we've got this leg together. It's lucky it's a man, isn't it?' "'Why?' asked Philip. "'They generally always like a male better,' said the attendant. "'A female's liable to have a lot of fat about her.' Philip looked at the body. The arms and legs were so thin that there was no shape in them, and the ribs stood out so that the skin over them was tense. A man of about forty-five with a thin gray beard and on his skull scanty colorless hair. The eyes were closed and the lower jaw sunken. Philip could not feel that this had ever been a man, and yet in the row of them there was something terrible and ghastly. "'I thought I'd start it too,' said the young man who was dissecting with Philip. "'All right, I'll be here then.' He had bought the day before the case of instruments which was needful, and now he was given a locker. He looked at the boy who had accompanied him into the dissecting room and saw that he was white. "'Make you feel rotten?' Philip asked him. "'I've never seen anyone dead before.' They walked along the corridor till they came to the entrance of the school. Philip remembered Fanny Price. She was the first dead person he had ever seen, and he remembered how strangely it had affected him. There was an immeasurable distance between the quick and the dead. They did not seem to belong to the same species, and it was strange to think that but a little while before they had spoken and moved and eaten and laughed. There was something horrible about the dead, and you could imagine that they might cast an evil influence on the living. "'What do you say to having something to eat?' said his new friend to Philip. They went down into the basement, where there was a dark room fitted up as a restaurant, and here the students were able to get the same sort of fare as they might have at an air raid at bread shop. While they ate, Philip had a scone and butter and a cup of chocolate, he discovered that his companion was called Dunsford. He was a fresh complexioned lad with pleasant blue eyes and curly dark hair, large limbed, slow of speech and movement. He had just come from Clifton. Are you taking the conjoint? he asked Philip. Yes, I want to get qualified as soon as I can. I'm taking it too, but I shall take the FRCS afterwards. I'm going in for surgery. 
most of the students took the curriculum of the conjoint board of the college of surgeons and the college of physicians but the more ambitious or the more industrious added to this the longer studies which led to a degree from the university of london when philip went to st luke's changes had recently been made in the regulations and the course took five years instead of four as it had done for those who registered before the autumn of eighteen ninety two dunsford was well up in his plans and told philip the usual course of events the first conjoint examination consisted of biology anatomy and chemistry but it could be taken in sections and most fellows took their biology three months after entering the school this science had been recently added to the list of subjects upon which the student was obliged to inform himself but the amount of knowledge required was very small when philip went back to the dissecting room he was a few minutes late since he had forgotten to buy the loose sleeves which they wore to protect their shirts and he found a number of men already working his partner had started on the minute and was busy dissecting out cutaneous nerves two others were engaged on the second leg and more were occupied with the arms you don't mind my having started that's all right fire away said philip he took the book open at a diagram of the dissected part and looked at what they had to find you're rather a dab at this said philip oh i've done a good deal of dissecting before animals you know for the pre side there was a certain amount of conversation over the dissecting table partly about the work partly about the prospects of the football season the demonstrators and the lectures philip felt himself a great deal older than the others they were raw schoolboys but age is a matter of knowledge rather than of years and newsome the active young man who was dissecting with him was very much at home with his subject he was perhaps not sorry to show off and he explained very fully to philip what he was about philip notwithstanding his hidden stores of wisdom listened meekly then philip took up the scalpel and the tweezers and began working while the other looked on ripping to have him so thin said newsome wiping his hands the blighter can't have had anything to eat for a month i wonder what he died of murmured philip oh i don't know any old thing starvation chiefly i suppose i say look out don't cut that artery it's all very fine to say don't cut that artery remarked one of the men working on the opposite leg silly old fools got an artery in the wrong place arteries are always in the wrong place said newsome the normal's the one thing you practically never get that's why it's called the normal don't say things like that said philip or i shall cut myself if you cut yourself answered newsome full of information wash it at once with antiseptic it's the one thing you've got to be careful about there was a chap here last year who gave himself only a prick and he didn't bother about it and he got septicemia did he get all right oh no he died in a week i went and had a look at him in the p m room philip's back ached by the time it was proper to have tea and his luncheon had been so light that he was quite ready for it his hand smelt of that peculiar odor which he had first noticed that morning in the corridor he thought his muffin tasted of it too oh you'll get used to that said newsome when you don't have the good old dissecting room stink about you feel quite lonely i'm not going to let it spoil my appetite said philip as he followed up the muffin with a piece of cake End of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five philip's ideas of the life of medical students like those of the public at large were founded on the pictures which charles dickens drew in the middle of the nineteenth century he soon discovered that bob sawyer if he ever existed was no longer at all like the medical student of the present it is a mixed lot which enters upon the medical profession and naturally there are some who are lazy and reckless they think it is an easy life idle away a couple of years and then because their funds come to an end or because angry parents refuse any longer to support them drift away from the hospital others find the examinations too hard for them one failure after another robs them of their nerve and panic-stricken they forget as soon as they come into the forbidding buildings of the conjoint board the knowledge which before they had so packed they remain year after year objects of good-humoured scorn to the younger men some of them crawl through the examination of the apothecary's hall others become non-qualified assistants a precarious position in which they are at the mercy of their employers 
their lot is poverty, drunkenness, and heaven only knows their end. But for the most part medical students are industrious young men of the middle class with a sufficient allowance to live in the respectable fashion they have been used to. Many are the sons of doctors who have already something of the professional manner. Their career is mapped out. As soon as they are qualified they propose to apply for a hospital appointment, after holding which, and perhaps a trip to the Far East as a ship's doctor, they will join their father and spend the rest of their days in a country practice. One or two are marked out as exceptionally brilliant. They will take the various prizes and scholarships which are open each year to the deserving, get one appointment after another at the hospital, go on the staff, take a consulting room in Harley Street, and, specializing in one subject or another, become prosperous, eminent, and titled. The medical profession is the only one which a man may enter at any age with some chance of making a living. Among the men of Philip's year were three or four who were past their first youth. One had been in the Navy, from which, according to report, he had been dismissed for drunkenness. He was a man of thirty with a red face, a brusque manner, and a loud voice. Another was a married man with two children who had lost money through a defaulting solicitor. He had a bowed look as if the world were too much for him. He went about his work silently, and it was plain that he found it difficult at his age to commit facts to memory. His mind worked slowly. His effort at application was painful to see. Philip made himself at home in his tiny room. He arranged his books and hung on the walls such pictures and sketches as he possessed. Above him on the drawing-room floor lived a fifth-year man called Griffiths. But Philip saw little of him, partly because he was occupied chiefly in the wards, and partly because he had been to Oxford. Some of the students, as had been to a university, kept a good deal together. They used a variety of means natural to the young in order to impress upon the less fortunate a proper sense of their inferiority. The rest of the students found their Olympian serenity rather hard to bear. Griffiths was a tall fellow, with a quantity of curly red hair and blue eyes, a white skin, and a very red mouth. He was one of those fortunate people whom everybody liked, for he had high spirits and a constant gaiety. He strummed a little on the piano and sang comic songs with gusto, and evening after evening, while Philip was reading in his solitary room, he heard the shouts and the uproarious laughter of Griffiths' friends above him. He thought of those delightful evenings in Paris when they would sit in the studio, Lawson and he, Flanagan and Clutton, and talk of art and morals, the love affairs of the present, and the fame of the future. He felt sick at heart. He found it was easy to make a heroic gesture, but hard to abide by its results. The worst of it was that the work seemed to him very tedious. He had got out of the habit of being asked questions by demonstrators. His attention wandered at lectures. Anatomy was a dreary science, a mere matter of learning by heart an enormous number of facts. Dissection bored him. He did not see the use of dissecting out laboriously nerves and arteries when with much less trouble you could see in the diagrams of a book or in the specimens of the pathological museum exactly where they were. He made friends by chance, but not intimate friends, for he seemed to have nothing in particular to say to his companions. When he tried to interest himself in their concerns he felt that they found him patronizing. He was not one of those who can talk of what moves them without caring whether it bores or not the people they talk to. One man, hearing that he had studied art in Paris and fancying himself on his taste, tried to discuss art with him but Philip was impatient of views which did not agree with his own, and finding quickly that the other's ideas were conventional grew monosyllabic. Philip desired popularity, but could bring himself to make no advances to others. A fear of rebuff prevented him from affability, and he concealed his shyness, which was still intense, under a frigid taciturnity. He was going through the same experience as he had done at school, but here the freedom of the medical student's life made it possible for him to live a good deal by himself. It was through no effort of his that he became friendly with Dunsford, the fresh-complexioned heavy lad whose acquaintances he had made at the beginning of the session. Dunsford attached himself to Philip merely because he was the first person he had known at St. Luke's. He had no friends in London, and on Saturday nights 
he and Philip got into the habit of going together to the pit of a music hall or the gallery of a theatre. He was stupid, but he was good-natured and never took offence. He always said the obvious thing, but when Philip laughed at him merely smiled. He had a very sweet smile. Though Philip made him his butt, he liked him. He was amused by his candour and delighted with his agreeable nature. Dunsford had the charm which himself was acutely conscious of not possessing. They often went to have tea at a shop in Parliament Street, because Dunsford admired one of the young women who waited. Philip did not find anything attractive in her. She was tall and thin, with narrow hips, and the chest of a boy. "'No one would look at her in Paris,' said Philip scornfully. "'She's got a ripping face,' said Dunsford. "'What does the face matter?' She had the small, regular features, the blue eyes, and the broad, low brow which the Victorian painters Lord Leighton, Alma Tadema, and a hundred others induced the world they lived in to accept as a type of Greek beauty. She seemed to have a great deal of hair. It was arranged with peculiar elaboration and done over the forehead in what she called an Alexandra fringe. She was very anemic. Her thin lips were pale and her skin was delicate, of a faint green color, without a touch of red even in the cheeks. She had very good teeth. She took great pains to prevent her work from spoiling her hands, and they were small, thin, and white. She went about her duties with a bored look. Dunsford, very shy with women, had never succeeded in getting into conversation with her, and he urged Philip to help him. "'All I want is a lead,' he said, "'and then I can manage for myself.' Philip, to please him, made one or two remarks, but she answered with monosyllables. She had taken their measure. They were boys, and she surmised they were students. She had no use for them. Dunsford noticed that a man with sandy hair and a bristly moustache who looked like a German was favored with her attention whenever he came into the shop, and then it was only by calling her two or three times that they could induce her to take their order. She used the clients whom she did not know with frigid insolence, and when she was talking to a friend was perfectly indifferent to the calls of the hurry. She had the art of treating women who desired refreshment with just that degree of impertinence which irritated them without affording them an opportunity of complaining to the management. One day Dunsford told him her name was Mildred. He had heard one of the other girls in the shop address her. "'What an odious name,' said Philip. "'Why?' asked Dunsford. "'I like it. It's so pretentious.' It chanced that on this day the German was not there, and when she brought the tea Philip, smiling, remarked, "'Your friend's not here today.' "'I don't know what you mean,' she said coldly. "'I was referring to the nobleman with the sandy moustache. Has he left you for another?' "'Some people would do better to mind their own business,' she retorted. She left them, and, since for a moment or two there was no one to attend to, sat down and looked at the evening paper which a customer had left behind. "'You are a fool to put her back up,' said Dunsford. "'I'm really quite indifferent to the attitude of her vertebrae,' replied Philip. But he was piqued. It irritated him that when he tried to be agreeable with a woman she should take offence. When he asked for the bill he hazarded a remark which he meant to lead further. "'Are we no longer on speaking terms?' he smiled. "'I'm here to take orders and to wait on customers. I've got nothing to say to them, and I don't want them to say anything to me.' She put down the slip of paper on which she had marked the sum they had to pay, and walked back to the table at which she had been sitting. Philip flushed with anger. "'That's one in the eye for you, Carrie,' said Dunsford, when they got outside. "'Ill-mannered slut,' said Philip. "'I shan't go there again.' His influence with Dunsford was strong enough to get him to take their tea elsewhere, and Dunsford soon found another young woman to flirt with. But the snub which the waitress had inflicted on him rankled. If she had treated him with civility he would have been perfectly indifferent to her. But it was obvious that she disliked him rather than otherwise, and his pride was wounded. He could not suppress a desire to be even with her. He was impatient with himself because he had so petty a feeling, but three or days' firmness during which he would not go to the shop did not help him to surmount it, and he came to the conclusion that it would be least trouble to see her. Having done so, he would certainly cease to think of her. Pretexting an appointment one afternoon, for he was not a little ashamed of his weakness, he left Dunsford and went straight to the shop which he had vowed never again to enter. He saw the waitress the moment he came in, 
and sat down at one of her tables. He expected her to make some reference to the fact that he had not been there for a week, but when she came up for his order she said nothing. He had heard her say to other customers, "'You're quite a stranger.' She gave no sign that she had ever seen him before. In order to see whether she had really forgotten him, when she brought his tea he asked, "'Have you seen my friend tonight? No, he's not been in here for some days.' He wanted to use this as the beginning of a conversation, but he was strangely nervous and could think of nothing to say. She gave him no opportunity, but at once went away. He had no chance of saying anything till he asked for his bill. "'Filthy weather, isn't it?' he said. It was mortifying that he had been forced to prepare such a phrase as that. He could not make out why she filled him with such embarrassment. It doesn't make much difference to me what the weather is, having to be in here all day. There was an insolence in her tone that peculiarly irritated him. A sarcasm rose to his lips, but he forced himself to be silent. I wish to God she'd say something really cheeky, he raged to himself, so that I could report her and get her sacked. It would serve her damned well right. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 He could not get her out of his mind. He laughed angrily at his own foolishness. It was absurd to care what an anemic little waitress said to him, but he was strangely humiliated. Though no one knew of the humiliation but Dunsford, and he had certainly forgotten, Philip felt that he could have no peace till he had wiped it out. He thought over what he had better do. He made up his mind that he would go to the shop every day. It was obvious that he had made a disagreeable impression on her, but he thought he had the wits to eradicate it. He would take care not to say anything at which the most susceptible person could be offended. All this he did, but it had no effect. When he went in and said good evening she answered with the same words, but when once he omitted to say it in order to see whether she would say it first, she said nothing at all. He murmured in his heart an expression which, though frequently applicable to members of the female sex, is not often used of them in polite society. But with an unmoved face he ordered his tea. He made up his mind not to speak a word, and left the shop without his usual good night. He promised himself that he would not go any more, but the next day at tea-time he grew restless. He tried to think of other things, but he had no command over his thoughts. At last he said desperately, "'After all, there's no reason why I shouldn't go if I want to.' The struggle with himself had taken a long time, and it was getting on for seven when he entered the shop. "'I thought you weren't coming,' the girl said to him when he sat down. His heart leaped in his bosom and he felt himself reddening. "'I was detained. I couldn't come before. Cutting up people, I suppose.' not so bad as that. You are a student, aren't you? Yes. But that seemed to satisfy her curiosity. She went away, and, since at that late hour there was nobody else at her tables, she immersed herself in a novelette. This was before the time of the sixpenny reprints. There was a regular supply of inexpensive fiction written to order by poor hacks for the consumption of the illiterate. Philip was elated. She had addressed him of her own accord. He saw the time approaching when his turn would come, and he would tell her exactly what he thought of her. It would be a great comfort to express the immensity of his contempt. He looked at her. It was true that her profile was beautiful. It was extraordinary how English girls of that class had so often a perfection of outline which took your breath away. But it was as cold as marble and the faint green of her delicate skin gave an impression of unhealthiness. All the waitresses were dressed alike, in plain black dresses, with a white apron, cuffs, and a small cap. On a half-sheet of paper that he had in his pocket, Philip made a sketch of her as he sat leaning over her book. She outlined the words with her lips as she read, and left it on the table when he went away. It was an inspiration, for next day, when he came in, she smiled at him. "'I didn't know you could draw.' she said. I was an art student in Paris for two years. I showed that drawing you'd left behind last night to the manageress, and she was struck with it. Was it meant to be me? It was, said Philip. When she went for his tea, one of the other girls came up to him. I saw that picture you'd done of Miss Rogers. It was the very image of her, she said. That was the first time he had heard her name, and when he wanted his bill he called her by it. I see you know my name, she said, when she came. 
Your friend mentioned it when she said something to me about that drawing. She wants you to do one of her. Don't you do it. If you once begin you'll have to go on, and they'll all be wanting you to do them. Then, without a pause, with peculiar inconsequence, she said, Where's that young fellow that used to come with you? Has he gone away? Fancying you remembering him, said Philip. He was a nice-looking young fellow. Philip felt quite a peculiar sensation in his heart. He did not know what it was. Dunsford had jolly curling hair, a fresh complexion, and a beautiful smile. Philip thought of these advantages with envy. "'Oh, he's in love,' said he with a little laugh. Philip repeated every word of the conversation to himself as he limped home. She was quite friendly with him now. When opportunity arose he would offer to make a more finished sketch of her, he was sure she would like that. Her face was interesting, the profile was lovely, and there was something curiously fascinating about the chloratic color. He tried to think what it was like. At first he thought of pea soup, but driving away that idea angrily he thought of the petals of a yellow rosebud when you tore it to pieces before it had burst. He had no ill feeling towards her now. "'She's not a bad sort,' he murmured. It was silly of him to take offense at what she had said. It was doubtless his own fault. She had not meant to make herself disagreeable. He ought to be accustomed by now to making at first sight a bad impression on people. He was flattered at the success of his drawing. She looked upon him with more interest now that she was aware of this small talent. He was restless next day. He thought of going to lunch at the tea-shop, but he was certain there would be many people there then, and Mildred would not be able to talk to him. He had managed before this to get out of having tea with Dunsford, and, punctually at half-past four, he had looked at his watch a dozen times, he went into the shop. Mildred had her back turned to him. She was sitting down talking to the German whom Philip had seen there every day till a fortnight ago, and since then had not seen at all. She was laughing at what he said. Philip thought she had a common laugh, and it made him shudder. He called her, but she took no notice. He called her again, then, growing angry for he was impatient, he rapped the table loudly with a stick. She approached sulkily. "'How do you do?' he said. "'You seem to be in a great hurry.' She looked down at him with the insolent manner which he knew so well. "'I say, what's the matter with you? If you'll kindly give me your order I'll get what you want. I can't stand talking all night.' "'Tea and toasted bun, please,' Philip answered briefly. He was furious with her. He had the star with him and read it elaborately when she brought the tea. "'If you'll give me my bill now I needn't trouble you again,' he said icily. She wrote out the slip, placed it on the table, and went back to the German. Soon she was talking to him with animation. He was a man of middle height with the round head of his nation and a sallow face. His moustache was large and bristling. He had on a tailcoat and grey trousers, and he wore a massive gold watch-chain. Philip thought the other girls looked from him to the pair at the table and exchanged significant glances. He felt certain they were laughing at him and his blood boiled. He detested Mildred now with all his heart. He knew that the best thing he could do was to cease coming to the tea-shop, but he could not bear to think that he had been worsted in the affair, and he devised a plan to show her that he despised her. Next day he sat down at another table and ordered his tea from another waitress. Mildred's friend was there again, and she was talking to him. She paid no attention to Philip, and so when he went out he chose a moment when she had to cross his path. As he passed he looked at her as though he had never seen her before. He repeated this for three or four days. He expected that presently she would take the opportunity to say something to him. He thought she would ask why he never came to one of her tables now, and he had prepared an answer charged with all the loathing he felt for her. He knew it was absurd to trouble, but he could not help himself. She had beaten him again. The German suddenly disappeared, but Philip still sat at other tables. She paid no attention to him. Suddenly he realized that what he did was a matter of complete indifference to her. He could go on in that way till doomsday, and it would have no effect. "'I'm not finished yet,' he said to himself. The day after he sat down in his old seat, and when she came up said good evening as though he had not ignored her for a week. His face was placid, but he could not prevent the mad beating of his heart. 
At that time the musical comedy had lately leaped into public favor, and he was sure that Mildred would be delighted to go to one. "'I say,' he said suddenly, "'I wonder if you'd dine with me one night and come to the Belle of New York. I'll get a couple of stalls.' He added the last sentence in order to tempt her. He knew that when the girls went to the play it was either in the pit, or, if some man took them, seldom to more expensive seats than the upper circle. Mildred's pale face showed no change of expression. "'I don't mind,' she said. "'When will you come? I get off early on Thursdays.' They made arrangements. Mildred lived with an aunt at Hearn Hill. The play began at eight, so they must dine at seven. She proposed that he should meet her in the second-class waiting-room at Victoria Station. She showed no pleasure, but accepted the invitation as though she conferred a favor. Philip was vaguely irritated. End of chapter 56 Recording by 